one of my favorite things to do in business and on this show is to extract lessons from what the biggest brands in the world are doing successfully to grow and to resonate with audiences. And my guest today is the perfect person to help us do that. Welcome to the Brand Gravity Show, where we explore the intersection between branding and psychology. I'm your host, psychology-driven brand strategist, Kay Putnam. And today I'm speaking with Paulo Ribeiro, who has had a storied career. At Widening Kennedy, he was the global head of brand strategy for Nike and also electronic arts. He worked directly with Reed Hoffman to figure out LinkedIn's positioning, helped Gatorade through a digital transformation, and so much more. These days, he's the founder of Two Things, which is a brand transformation agency, and he focuses on the active lifestyle category. So he has worked with some of my favorite brands, including North Face, Timberland, and more. So let's dive into my conversation with Paulo to learn what he knows working with these massive brands that speak to the hearts and minds of their audience. Thank you so much for being on the show. I'm excited to glean a bit of your branding wisdom. You've had a storied career. Maybe let's start. Can you talk a little bit about your agency and the kind of work that you do? Yeah, um, it's awesome to be here. Thank you for having me on. So the agency is called Two Things. We started in Portland, Oregon. Now we're by coastal with teams in New York and and on the West Coast. And you know, with remote workers, there's a few people scattered in between as well. The agency was started to kind of like be a salmon fighting upstream, you know, against sort of like what has happened in the industry, which is like a lot of executional work. So we do brand transformation. And what that means is clients come to us and we seek them out when they want to overhaul how they're going to market. Usually there's like a big business reason that's driving that. They want to enter a new industry. They're launching a new product. But sometimes it's just, hey, the approach to marketing has gotten stale and we need to rethink the marketing strategy, what the creative look like, looks like, the channels we're using, and just like soup to nuts kind of overhaul that. So we do the strategic work, the creative concepting work, and then we act as management consultants, depending on do they have an internal agency, external, none of the above. How is this work going to be executed over time? So we're a catalyst for change, and then we create kind of the toolkit and the roadmap to bring that stuff to life. We have had clients over the past five years in a bunch of different industries, but there's been this gravitational pull towards like sports and sports adjacent, what we call yeah. kind of active lifestyle brands. So Converse, Timberland, North Face, Arcteryx, like a lot of brands like that. But we do have some tech clients as well. But yeah, the common thread is they need to shift how they're going to market. Secretly, really jealous that those are all of your clients because those are some of my favorite brands. And I love that you have played such an interesting role in helping shape some of the amazing campaigns that they've come out with. Um, a lot of my audience loves to learn from big brands and mm -hmm. we're looking up to brands like North Face. One of the questions I had as I was looking through your case studies was, I'm curious how you approach as a strategist, how do you balance the legacy of the brand? So this overarching narrative that has been around for decades in many cases with how the market or how the context is shifting? How do you instigate that change while still preserving what's amazing about those brands? Yeah, I could. that's a great question. I could legitimately spend an hour, maybe <laughs> three, maybe five months on that. So I actually wrote a post on a portion of the answer to this question, which maybe we can link to in the show notes. But, yeah. you know, brands that have been around for a while, and this is, you know, you're talking about very established brands that have, you know, you know, been around for decades and, you know, sell products in a bunch of different categories in a bunch of different ways. The history is a super important ingredient. You know, brand you know, brand is like, you know, it's it's a set of values. It builds emotionally. People have like generalized feelings about this. That stuff takes so long to develop. And yeah. to ignore that and throw that away is stupid. But at the same time, you know, a lot of brands get stuck on just rehashing the brand history. Right. Like, I, hey, here's our origin story. We, you know, our founders did X, Y, and Z. We became really established selling this one product. 
And I'm just going to tell that story through like the lens of nostalgia over and over again. It's, this is what, you know, that post that I mentioned is about is like your brand history is not your brand strategy. So the Mm. other side of this is brand is organic. If you want to connect with hearts and minds today, you really have to tap into interesting subcultures and be aware of what's happening in culture. And so to stay put and just sort of rehash the history, and a lot of sports brands get stuck here, a lot of outdoor brands get stuck there, is kind of like being left behind. Now, you asked, like, how do we do it? There are a lot of models for this that are sort of taking into account what is the current consumer landscape, what's going on in culture, what's happening with the business, what are the business goals. We use... We have something that we've developed, and I'm not saying this approach is novel, but it's really distilled. We look at category, culture, and product. Sorry for that. And the reason we do that, if we understand the nuances of the business category, we understand kind of the playing field that we're in. The consumer, the the cultural piece is what is happening in hearts and minds, both with the people we already have as customers and the people that we want to connect with. And the product is kind of like the pragmatic reality. Like, what are we selling to people? Is it actually filling a current need? But also, you know, you work with clients under NDA and you understand sort of where they're going. What's the roadmap? What else are we going to be building? And we've found that if we triangulate sort of those three big categories of information, we can find really good insights and tensions that like paves the way for, okay, what should we do next? And that's just, that's just a process technique. But, you know, to zoom all the way out, I'd say, like, fundamentally, you need to know who you are and where you came from. And then you need to find interesting ways to bring that to life every year based on what's current. I love that. It's fascinating. And I agree we could spend hours here, but I want to make sure that we're distilling this and making it relevant for many of the the Do you want an example? Yes, I would love that. Okay. (laughs) All right. So I'll give like a big company example and then I'll kind of give maybe a a little company example as well. So a big company example. So a lot of my career, you know, just getting out of like the marketing wonk speak, I've had like a lot of experience in tech, spent about 10 years in Silicon Valley and working with sort of early stage startups and very highly funded companies that are now like sort of global behemoths. And then I'd say like in brand advertising and a lot of sports brands and sports adjacent. So Nike has been a client of mine for at like at multiple stops in my career. When I was running Red Scout, I was head of brand strategy for Nike globally. I widened at Kennedy. I built a technology innovation studio called Lodge and Nike's Innovation Kitchen was a client. You know, they just announced a partnership with Electronic Arts, another one of my former clients called Dot Swoosh, which is basically like how do you design sneakers in the 3D landscape? How to use gaming platforms and EA Sports kind of ecosystems, right? 2017. So six years ago, we were working with Nike's Innovation Kitchen and launched something called Live Design, which is a way for people to design shoes on their feet, slipping on this blank white shoe, designing it while you're walking around, getting that thing within 60 minutes. It debuted at Fashion Week. We were also piloting, what does that look like in AR, in VR, on a gaming console, etc. So the thing I want to stress here is like, what is Nike? Nike's positioning is innovation and inspiration for athletes everywhere. How do you fuel sport performance, right? They, there are technical ways to do that. Shoes that give you energy return, that have more grip, cleats that like, you know, when you cut left and right, like plant in the ground. There's also these emotional ways, like, do I feel strong and look good, like in what I'm wearing? And how do we tap into the ways that people are sort of interacting in culture? So gaming platforms, metaverse, you know, 3D design, et cetera. Great example of knowing like, what is the history of the brand? Now, how do you deploy it like today? And we started that work six years ago. They're launching it at scale with this dot swoosh par- partnership today. So there's, I think, two insights I want to stress about that. One is know who you are and where you come from and find ways to bring that to life that's interesting today. And that includes the technology platforms that, you know, kids and people are using. And the other side of that is like, this shit, sorry, takes time. You might need to edit that out. It takes time. (laughs) It takes a lot of time. And you need to have like, especially big companies, you have to have this dichotomy in your head, which is, you know, every move you, you know, a company, Nike, the market cap of what, close to 50 billion. It's like every move they make has to be done at scale. But if you, everything is a big move to scale, you never incubate the interesting stuff. So know who you are and where you come from, bring it to life in interesting ways, experiment, 
and then find ways to scale that. And it may take a long time. Now, that's a big company example. Early stage companies should be concerned with the same thing. They're just like trying to figure out what's my product market fit, right? So I started working with LinkedIn when they were a pretty small company and they asked us to help with like with brand positioning. Well, at that point, they saw themselves as just like a job hunting site. And the thing that became really clear was that the opportunity was actually to be a partner for your whole career. Now, look at LinkedIn today. Maybe this has jumped the shark in terms of like how much time people while sitting at the office are spending on LinkedIn. But it be, you know, they were doing things like spamming your entire contact list right in the beginning. Yeah. You'd sign up yeah. and they'd blast it all out. And the reality was like, hold on, we need to stop that so that we condition people that this product has a different role in their lives. It enter all the content, you know, and all the sort of resources for people to be better at their careers. So this dynamic of like, who are you? It can have a legacy, like a Nike or a Gatorade. Or it can be, hey, it's nascent. And either way, you need to distill that. And then you also need to be a little organic and flexible with like how it's deployed, you know, in the product experience and the onboarding or, you know, in the advertising, you know, as you launch new products, like it always put it through that lens, have some flexibility and some rigor. I have like 16 different <laughs> angles that I'm bouncing around in my mind. That's so because I'm random lot. and I tee up a bunch of different things. I love it. That's <laughs> how my brain works too. The thing that's coming up for me is, so you talk a lot about what legacy brands can learn from Silicon Valley. I'm kind of curious on the opposite side of that question. What can startups or Silicon Valley learn from the legacy brands? Oh man, so much. You know, we talk... Right, at, right from the jump on this call, we were talking about like, you know, how brand is this emotional thing and it has to be yeah. built and cultivated over time. Like there's huge value in that. And, you know, one of the things like I talk to a lot of our clients about is my career started like when AORs were still business partners. You know, I, I started McCann Erickson and then was at Hal Reine and is at Wyden and Kennedy. And like the relationship with like the C-suite was like really long term. And you know, in, infused in every part of the business. And then like today, you know, most clients have internal agencies and a lot of the work is, is transactional and like kind of short-term project-based, right? Yeah. And so one of the things we talk about a lot with our clients is like when the internet came along and basically made advertising inventory infinite, and like you really have to understand that, right? Like you know, so this culture of performance marketing that we have today, which has like tremendous effectiveness, like you do have to stop and think like, okay, hold on a second. Attention spans are limited. There is advertising on every single platform, including like just in the last few weeks, all those paid platforms whose business proposition, trust me, I'm going to connect these dots, I promise. All, like next, like what was that? I don't want to pay for advertising. I will subscribe. Now there, there's yeah. like an advertising supported level inside Amazon as well, inside Uber, et cetera, right? So there's advertising on every surface, but our brains haven't changed, right? We still have the ability to connect with the sa essentially the same amount of people deeply, to digest the same amount of messages. And digital advertising has made inventory infinite. It wasn't always that case. I got a bunch of gray hairs like at the beginning of my career, like there were fixed like, you know, eyeballs or ears that you could connect to, right? And so we've replaced that with a bunch of data, right? And like, so anyone who works in SEO, SEM, digital advertising, like those hubs and the number of dials that they can tweak in an ad campaign to optimize, to look at the analytics differently, it's crazy how deep that is, right? And then we put in all that middleware in between and you have to ask yourself, why? Well, the reason is it is in the platform's best interest to create inefficiency in that advertising model because you pay them, right? So, as a, so to circle all of this back, our attention span is limited. There are more and more opportunities to interrupt every week. And we've replaced, we've inserted to the marketing ecosystem a whole bunch of analytics tools that aren't always in our best interest, meaning we should use them, but we should be really well aware that like there is so much more waste in this system than there is effectiveness. And so you asked, what can early stage companies learn from like legacy brands? It's not 
binary. It's not like growth hacking and performance marketing can replace emotional connections and brand building because there is a limit to the size that that company can grow to. And it's yeah. both. You know, there was a study that was put out, I think it was the AMA recently, that finally just quantified like, you know, the symphonic effect of like brand advertising and performance marketing when they're actually tuned to each other. Like the ROI is like 3X. When you only do one or the other, there's tremendous waste. So, you know, people in marketing have always want, sought out the most interesting, newest tools and totally should. But you got to do it eyes wide open that like, you know, in the digital advertising ecosystem, it's mostly waste and noise because humans' brains haven't changed. So are you building a brand or are you like, you know, you know, disintermediating and, and capturing share? from something that already existed. You know, there's an old rule in business, like there's only two jobs you can do, marketing essentially, right? Which is you can grow share or you can steal share. They have the only two ways to succeed. Every company that's come in and like disintermediated a market, they're stealing share. They're, they're not growing share unless they create a new market. Most, most brands don't do that. Yeah, it's hard to do. Such a great reminder to keep the larger story, the larger narrative in mind when you're making all of those marketing decisions. That said, you touched on something that I've been feeling a lot too, that that noise. How are you deciding what to pay attention to in terms of new tools, new trends, new new things that are coming out? It's so hard. I mean, so one of the things that I'm drawn to, and maybe it's a tool for what you just described. I'm drawn to teams that have like a real interesting mix of people, like a lot of different working styles, a lot of different backgrounds. And, you know, one of the things that people that are creatives, like a lot of creatives are easily distracted and curious about a lot of things. It's why you can take on a bunch <laughs> of different client projects and like find something interesting in it, right? It draws creative people to, to those industries. But so there's a danger there, right? It's like yeah. every new client, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna be an become an expert in like you know SaaS transportation or to, it's like direct to consumer you know, cereals or whatever it is, right? Yeah. I try to surround my people myself with people that are subject matter experts and ask them a lot of questions and not try to go too deep in any executional tool myself. Mm -hmm. Now there are exceptions to that and stuff like you know if you're worked with Unity Technologies and we were tasked with building their first, the strategy and then the prototype and then the go-to-market plan for the first consumer product ever. It was an AR 3D creation app. This is like, you know, an arc of like almost two year project. I was managing a cross-functional team, strategists, UX people, engineers, a lot of creatives of different stripes, mixed media artists, et cetera. Like I'm not going to be a better coder than them. I'm not going to be better at UX than them, but because that project was huge scale, I did get into playing myself with some 3D tools. But I didn't, don't get it twisted. It's like, that's not going to be the thing that I really add. I just wanted to play with that to understand it a little more because that project was long and deep. In general, it's don't, for me, it's don't try to, you know, be an omnivore of the related information and don't try to go too deep in any one executional domain because you'd lose the forest for the trees. Now, that's my role as like my job is to like set a vision and integrate teams. So if I don't stay at that level, I do my job poorly, but I definitely need people around me that go super deep in a function. Some subsection of my audience who are aspiring brand strategists, so I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, what do you see as the best route to breaking into this career path? It's a great question. All right. So Brand strategy is one of those terms that like can mean a lot of different things in a lot of different organizations. And yeah. now we have a lot of people with the brand strategy title that are internal in a client organization. It has a very different shape in an innovation agency. I ran Red Scout. That's an innovation agency. So it's IDEO, Stone Yamashita. It has a different shape from those in an ad agency like a Wyden and Kennedy or a Gray or what have you. The common thread between all of them is a brand strategist's job is to identify and open people's eyes to new pathways for working. Mm -hmm. And the really excellent ones at that are good at researching a bunch of kind of related stuff, but can like pull out of that a narrative and a narrative that will inspire. Now, 
at an ad agency, well, actually, I won't get into sort of the pitfalls. What I'll say is like, you have to be good at research. You have to be good at like pulling out insights and you have to distill those in a way that like a, a team with different backgrounds, business people, maybe product people, engineering folks, UX people, storytellers, art and copy people are like, hell yeah, we want to go over there and do that. But the nuance is like, what's the shape of your team? And am I doing it inside on the client side? Am I doing it at, at an agency? Th that will mean like your approaches to research and what the shape of the team is going to vary. So I want to highlight that because it's not one thing. At an ad agency, yeah. you're usually a catalyst for narrative storytelling. At a UX or a web shop, it's often like, okay, here's it gets a little more technical. What's the UX we should have? And like, you know, what's the happy path for this product? And if you're client side, it's usually like, hey, I'm really, I'm the keeper of like some integrity of the brand. And then each time we like launch a new product, it's like, what's the new chapter in the story? And so you have to be both about consistency and, and innovation, but the, in, the innovation is more like lowercase i. You ask like, how should people get, get involved in that? My, I, I get asked this question a lot and I tell people like for the first 10 years of your career, sample what brand strategy means at different kinds of organizations. Try it at a startup, try it at a largest established company, go to a, a full service ad agency. Now go to like a specialist kind of consulting shop. There's two reasons for that. One, you will learn the common threads of this craft, and you will also get a flavor for like, where do you feel most at home? And that's super important. And it's not just for the first couple of years out of college, if you're lucky enough to go to college, like it, like when you start your career sample for like 10 years and you're going to find the flavor is super different and in, in those different organizations. And in that, you're going to learn something about yourself and what you're good at. Yes. So you mentioned researching and then crafting narratives as two keystone skill sets. Do you have any favorite resources or ways to develop those skills? Yeah. And I, I think... This is another thing that I could go on a rant about and I'll try to be, I'll try to be disciplined, which is super hard for me. Research is not strategy, right? Like research is like, I'm looking at information. An excellent person who's great at research is pulling out the signal from the noise. What is relevant versus like what we can just like ignore for whatever reason, because of the business reason, because of the cultural landscape, because of what's coming in the product roadmap. If you really want to be a strategist, you'll get out of, you will have some foundation in research and then you'll get out of it pretty quick. You need to be a synthesizer. Now you asked yeah. about resources. So I think any strategist that is excellent has at least been part of designing a methodology that's custom to that client and each project and has done it a number of times. It doesn't require that they're the one doing qualitative interviews or ethnographies or you know, man and woman on the streets or doing UX research, but it does require that they understand what those different tools are and yeah. when you apply them. And so for each of those situations, there's syndicated research that you can buy off the shelf that sometimes is a really good shortcut to like getting a, you know, a, a, a landscape of like an industry that you're new to. That could be Mintel, that could be like Profit, it could be like Forrester and Gartner. If you're doing anything in kind of digital products, I'd say familiar, familiarize yourself with like UX research tools. I'm a big fan of Dscout as mm -hmm. something that you, they, you can run on your own and customize a methodology or they can set it up for you. And I'd say you need to balance like things that are at scale, like huge surveys that have huge surveys that have like an N that's in the thousands or tens of thousands, Pew and Gartner and stuff like that with things that are like intimate. And that could be like one-on-one yeah. -on -one ethnographies and, you know, qualitative that you set up. It could be trios or what have you. And, and the reason I say that is the fuel for creativity is tensions between like two things that can be like, you know, true at the same time, but like aren't quite squared away. And a fast shortcut to getting there is like, what's the big data about population say? But then I talked to five people and what did I learn? And these two things are incongruent. Get really skilled at find different methodologies and then looking at the results. You mentioned creativity, and I want to touch on that before we wrap up. You've been a part of innovation agencies and organizations that were focused on innovation. Do you have any advice for entrepreneurs who are trying to balance what is and like keeping the 
boat afloat, <laughs> the ship running versus how do we make time or how do we apply a methodology to be more creative in our businesses and our brands? So would this be like a, a client site, like a product company, or are you talking about a small agency? I'm imagining either a small agency or a visionary that's building a brand themselves. How do you? Yeah, I think the answer is different for you. those two situations. Yeah. You're saying like, you know, how do you, if I'm going to play that back, I would almost say is like, how do I, how do I build a capability or a skill set when I'm totally filled up with like kind of keeping the lights on, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's super hard. But if you don't get out of that situation, you know, if you don't actually like ply your time on getting out of that situation, you never will. So the thing about being an entrepreneur is, and I've learned this the hard way, if you are running an agency and you are spending the bulk of your time doing the work, you aren't guiding the future of that company. You should probably let yeah. go of the day-to-day -day work. I, I think of this concept of working in the company and on the company. Mm -hmm. So working in the company is reacting to kind of what's coming at you. And working on the company is, you know, building kind of the, the, the future and the next step and solving some of those problems in a way that's repeatable. You know, one of the, I've worked in really established agencies. I've built my own from scratch and I've been done something that's in the middle, like an agency that needs to evolve. I, you know, led Red Scout in San Francisco and tuned them towards Silicon Valley and got to build Lodge for Wyden and Kennedy. You know, Wyden and Kennedy had been around 40 years at that point, right? So yeah. here's a big difference between being an exec at a large company and being an entrepreneur at something small. At a big company, you are managing inbound. You have a bunch of responsibilities. You have a bunch of employees. They have a bunch of stuff that comes inbound to you, their needs, their dissatisfaction, stuff they want to get done and just want you to be a champion of. You have your peers who want to you know, collaborate with you on something or there's conflict. You have your bosses, you have your clients. It's all inbound. And as an exec, yeah. if you don't filter that inbound, like meaning spend your time on the highest and most important stuff, you'll drown. As an entrepreneur, you have to create the inbound. So if you just wait for the stuff that comes at you, it's low level BS that is based on your early stage. And if you spend all of your time responding to that, you're never creating the new thing. And so this, just to tie it back to working on the company and in the company, if you're an entrepreneur, you have to manage what you're doing, but that means mo it's not managing inbound. It's being a catalyst for the right stuff that's down the road. Whereas if you're an exec, it's already coming at you. And a lot of the high value stuff is coming at you. Make sure you just filter out the low level stuff. And that means delegate, you know, or just realize like, hey, it's, that's not going to be solved. And that's OK, because I'm going to spend my time on the thing that's important to solve. Amazing. That hit different. I've heard, you know, make sure that you make space for working on the business, but that the way that you worded it hit differently. And I really appreciate, you know, in all that. of these, like there's just the human thing, which is like, you have to have balance in your life. You have to have some perspective. You need to be yeah. healthy. So I was just, I was trying to answer that question, Kay, just through the lens of like, okay, during the working hours, how can I be most effective? But the, the balance thing is also true. hundred percent. Like your results will never, never outpace your energy. I like to say. For those who want to learn more about you, about the work that you're doing, all of those things, where should they go? Company website is two things.co, not O T H I N G S. There's um, a founder page there where you can find out more about me and my bio. My email is paulo at two things.co, P A U L O at T W O T H I N G S dot C. Amazing. And I like to always wrap up with one final short question. If you were to summarize, and I know that we covered a lot. I, mean, I went in a few different directions. But for the visionary that's building a brand, who's leading a brand, what is one thing that you would recommend that they do or implement or take action on after listening to this interview? So for me, above all, the, the work that I have been lucky enough to be a part of, it was that was really consequential at early stage of my career or later. It was through it was through a team. So that my short answer is make sure you are surrounding yourselves with people that are leaning in and committed, that they have a diverse perspective and skill sets, and that to, you're working on things together against a common vision. 
If you are the leader, set that vision. If you want to accomplish it, curate the team. And that is a never ending prospect. And it is the only way great things get done. We live in a culture today that like kind of fetishizes this myth. And it is completely a myth of like the entrepreneur who like had every answer. And you look at all of those people and look at who they've surrounded themselves with and ask yourself, did they do it alone? Nope. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom with us today. I learned so much and I know that everybody listening has as well. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure to chat with you. You do great work. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Brand Gravity Show. I hope you enjoyed this episode and my conversation with Paulo as much as I did. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you. Please share this episode if you found something insightful. That always helps me to hear what is resonating, what's landing with you as I continue to attract more guests to this show. And I hope, if anything, today's conversation inspires you to keep building your brand, to keep sharing your genius and reaching the people that you are meant to serve and impact in this world. I'll see you in the next episode.